So the next question is why do Amazon chicks, Amazon parrot chicks die at around 27 days of age, even though the temperature is controlled? Um, many chicks suffer from something that is called clostridium and it's transferred to them in, in water of questionable quality. And you get to see that the cockatoos turn white and, uh, macaw and amazon and eclectus chicks get a huge belly and they don't defecate so i would say when a mortality happens at that age i would look at water quality i would look at temperature i would look at having enough fat in the diet commercial formulas tend to err on safety meaning that they don't have enough fat they don't have enough fat to meet the requirements of a chick. And you see these chicks that are always hungry. Uh, we did uh, a series of videos in my hand rearing room and we could hold this conversation. The chicks weren't screaming. I have been in aviaries where they had to wear uh, noise controlling headsets because the chicks were screaming so bad. They were screaming so bad because they weren't getting enough fat in the diet. They were hungry. They were starving. So I'd say water quality. I would say diet. I would look at temperature. And I would look at hygiene. Chicks shouldn't be dying unless there's, a, there's something wrong. They just don't die. Um, so when you look at those couple of issues, you can generally pinpoint it for one. Um, if you do use antibiotics, for example, and rofloxacin, Batril, you need to understand that if you abuse it, it will cause problems. And eclectus, you'll get pinch feathers that look like they have beacon feather disease. Um, in, um, in golden conures, it causes a certain level of retarded growth. They sort of stop developing for a while and they, they grow again. So understand that Using antibiotics should be a last recourse, uh, and that the first should be water quality, hygiene, proper diet, proper temperature. 
the next question is this direction this this the direction of the next box influence breeding and what is my recommendation to put a nest opposite to the wind um we were talking earlier as we walked around my aviary and i said that one of the greatest lessons i ever had i was seven it was 1979 I was 19 years old i was a kid and i visited an american breeder by the name of ramon nogue He was a Kardecian spiritualist priest. He would communicate with spirits and he had a church. And it was all pretty bizarre. But he told me something that initially I laughed at. In fact, I said he's crazy. He said the parrots talk to you. Listen to them and you will be successful. I came home and mentioned it to my grandparents and they said perhaps you're reading it too textually you're expecting them to talk to you in words maybe he meant something else after a lot of thought a lot of thinking i realized that he was right that the parrots do talk to us using expressions behavior uh actions likes dislikes so what i've learned over the many years is a couple of things most avicultures tend to make the nest boxes way too big parrots in the wild don't have this roomy hotel room to breed in they have a very tight closet as it were so a very tight cavity they tend to pick cavities that are very deep and very dark so a predator can't look inside and see a shiny egg or a little moving chick with pale down um and i've realized that the nest direction is less important than the depth the darkness and what the birds like we tend to give a pair of birds a nest that would be standard for example for poicephalus parrots it's either 10 inches square 25 centimeters by 30 inches 75 centimeters and if they don't like that we tend to go smaller and deeper um we have a pair of senegal that like a nest 25 centimeters square by a meter 20 deep it's the only nest they use We also have a pair of Myers parrots that like the same nest. They sort of let us know what nest they like or they don't like. I have a pair of macaws that lay on the floor of their cage. I have a chicken nest that's open at the front, and that's where they raise their chicks. So we need to give the birds an opportunity to select the nest, but we also need to keep into consideration the types of nest they use in the wild. A macaw will nest in a tree cavity in a cliff face. A brooded jerry's parakeet will nest in a termite mound, which means that a standard nest should be more of a square and it should be filled up with cork to replicate the termite. They sort of tunnel and then they build a nesting chamber. So you offer multiple solutions, multiple nests within what the birds would like in the wild. And there's lots of books Four Shaw's Parrots of the World talks about nest site and nest cavities. In my Sitaculture book, I have lots of details about nests. Uh, people say you you seem to give a lot of devotion to diet and nests, and that's because we need to extrapolate from the wild. If we do that, we'll be successful. The next question um, regarding artificial insemination for large birds. what is the correct method and should it be performed at certain times of the year look i think that artificial insemination is just beginning um it's been a standard procedure in water following pigeons and all kinds of other birds but in parrots it's basically 2013 that it really started 2012 2013 that it started being used i think that it is preliminary 
I think that you can cause a lot of harm because you need to insert a probe inside the male bird that will discharge electricity. It will get semen to come out and then you need to know when the female is about to lay. You don't artificially inseminate an Amazon outside the breeding season because they're seasonal breeders. You could inseminate cockatoos that breed year-round. But I think that still the science is not there for it to be widely practiced. I see um, um, kids and I see people doing videos. And those birds get very traumatized. I think the electron, uh, electric probe uh, releases a volt. Uh, that is less invasive than grabbing this bird and squeezing and stressing the bird to the point that you may lose it. Um, I think if, you're due, if you have to resort to that, then you're a very poor breeder. Um, I have yet to see a bird that would not breed in captivity. Um, we have a pair of uh, blueback parrots. They came to us after sitting in a collection for 30 years, three decades, for bread. Never showed any interest. We looked at the birds. We listened and what they were telling us. Clearly, they were not providing a proper nest. She wanted a nest that was very dark, very secluded. And within three months, we had the first chick. In fact, we have three chicks in the baby room right now. Um, so if you listen to the birds, they will breed without having to resort to artificial insemination. I think 10 years from now, the way science is evolving, it may be very common. But until then, I think you're stressing the birds and, and really cause, you can cause a lot of damage. Um, what is the best way to care for palm cockatoos? And what is the secret uh, to stopping their death? Um, look, I think I would be foolish to think that wild palm cockatoos are not flowing out of Indonesia. I've seen them throughout Asia. Um, I've seen them in, 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 in China and elsewhere. But what happens with these birds is that they are trapped. They go through very poor conditions. They end up a mess. Uh, I've seen uh, where the beak has started to decompose because of these burrowing mites. So I think they need to be treated. They need to be examined. They need to be treated for chlamydia. Um, they need to be given a diet. They need to be a diet that's suitable, understanding their needs. They're just not like a regular cockatoo. Um, when you rear chicks, the chicks are naked. They require a higher fat, a chunky diet, rather than this creamy formula we, we traditionally use. Um, and they require you know, treatment for all of these pathogens that they've acquired along the way. They've been giving dirty water. Sometimes they've not had water. Um, I think this trade is not good. I think it's causing a lot of these rare birds to die. Uh, and I think that palm cockatoos, when they are in captivity, there's a large enough number that can be properly managed to keep the species very much alive. Um, Katie Milk Elroy here in the U.S. is probably one of the most successful breeders ever. And um, her information, her formula, is basically a little bit of what I've used with slight modifications. Uh, but in Citiculture, I describe her process because there isn't one way to skin a cat. There are many ways to skin a cat. And hers was quite good. So, you know, I think that when you're rearing chicks, you need to look at a diet that's been proven. They need, you know, we added broccoli and chopped nuts and uh, oils to it and she basically does the same thing. She adds kefir and sprouted pulses. Um, so she adds a number of other things. So there's many ways to get there. Uh, the key thing is to understand that they need a chunky diet and the adults have gone through a lot. But unless they're clean, you just don't take a bird that's been trapped and throw it in your aviary and not worry about it. That bird will break down. It's been through stress been through bad food, it's been through bad water quality. It needs to be checked out. 
And you don't need to be a, a veterinarian to be able to do many of these things. You can do cultures. It's a very simple process. And that process can save you a lot of headaches. Is, is sand harmful to parrots because of salt? Look, I think that there are two schools of thought in agriculture. One, that parrots need grit in order to be able to digest this food. And in the process, they absorb certain calcium. And those that say uh, they don't need this. Um, I don't think that most parrots eat grit or would eat sand. Um, for any reason. Uh, in captivity, they do it, uh, and it can cause problems. You can impact the crop of a budgie or a cockatiel because it'll overfeed on grit or sand. So I don't think it is necessary. We're approaching the, the rainy season in Miami, so there's lots of mosquitoes. Um, I don't think they are necessary. Um, I think that um, a little bit of salt is not harmful in very small amounts. Parrots in the wild will feed on salty clay, on, on, on salt or mineral rich deposits. So they're clearly looking for salt in other minerals. And I think in very slight moderation they are suitable. But if you give a good diet, uh, if you include some processed foods, for example, we give our birds, we make little sandwiches out of peanut butter. And it's whole grain bread, organic, the best gray bread that you can buy. We put a little bit of peanut butter and I give it to my birds every day. It's a way for me to interact with my birds. They go crazy for it. It is their treat. And that has a little bit of salt. So they're getting a little bit of salt like that. Would I give them sand? No, I would not. I don't give my birds grit. Um, I don't give them grit because they are on a pellet diet. They get about 60-70% pellets and that should provide all their mineral. That should provide their calcium requirements. Um, there are far better sources of calcium than oyster grit, than oyster shell, or cuttle bone, which is one of the questions. Um, so giving them a good diet, you can eliminate a lot of this stuff. Is it advisable um, to give gram? to large, medium, and small parrots, and how much. I believe the word gram is what we call pulses. It's various grains. Is that correct? Do I like grains? Absolutely. I think they are a nutritious food, particularly if they're sprouted. Um, if they are sprouted and parboiled because of bacteria in the sprouts, they're even better. Uh, I think they are great food. I think they provide moisture and rich food that can be good to induce breeding. When you sprout, you need to wash, wash, and wash. You need to disinfect and wash, and wash, and wash. Poorly sprouted grains are the greatest source of pathogens um, in foods we give our birds because they absorb water, and then they heat, they generate heat, and that heat generates bacteria, and bacteria is lethal. So if you sprout, you've got to make sure you use clean water. You've got to make sure you wash those grains heavily. Um, I would soak them before I would feed them in apple cider vinegar, and I would use 30 mLs per 3.8 liters. And I would leave them soak for 15 minutes, I would wash them in that, and then I would rinse. Um, and I would only provide sprouts in, in cooler weather, not in hot weather where the birds will chew a piece and then the rest just sits there and ferments and decomposes in the heat. So do I think they're good? Absolutely. If you sprout them and then if you boil them, you can give them to the birds um, and then just change the bowls. We have multiple bowls so we can switch in and out um, as food becomes available. Are oyster shells uh, useful to parrots? I think I've sort of answered that before. I would not use oyster shell. I would rather use a good calcium 
um, than oyster shell. I think there are uh, it's far better source of calcium. It's it's less irritating. It's less uh, problematic to digest. So you can either add calcium to the water. I don't like adding vitamins or anything to the water. I don't believe in tonics. I don't believe in any of this. After 45 years, I've been there. I've done that. And you know what results I've seen? Zero. I get far more out of my birds by providing them with a good diet, by having a good rapport with them, by giving them the proper nest and some enrichment, than I do trying to get shortcuts by feeding them all kinds of. Adding all kinds of things to their water.、Um, in fact, we've cultured vitamin water, and it becomes bacterial soup. Most vitamins have a little bit of sugar or sweetener in it, and that stuff becomes a primary source for these bacteria. That in the heat, parrots dunk food in their in their water, so you've got decomposing food, sugar, perfect environment for、uh, for bacteria. So I don't believe in adding those things, and I don't believe in oyster shell. They don't need it, and there are far better sources of calcium. And then the last question is: Is cuttle bones good, or are they bad for salt? Look, I think that cuttle bones are used through the 1970s, early stages of aviculture, as a means of providing the birds with calcium. There's far better sources of calcium. Uh, in fact, cuttle bone can be contaminated with mercury, with all kinds of things. So I would definitely forego the cuttle bone, and I would use a good source of calcium.、Um, and you can add, you can add calcium to soft food.、Um, when you give soft food, you can use things like whole grain pasta. You can use whole grain rice. You can add to it vegetables. You can add to it、um, whole grain bread. You can add to it egg yolk,、uh, whole egg.、Um, we feed some of the small birds、um, a mixture that contains whole grain bread, grated carrot,、uh, boiled eggs,、uh, chopped greens, and some wheat germ, and they get that. They get what we call、uh, French toast, which is basically whole grain bread dipped in egg,、um, and then baked. We try to give the birds something special every day. We want those birds to look forward to that meal. We want to give them foods that are healthy. They shouldn't be full of sugar. They shouldn't be full of hydrogenated fat. They shouldn't be full of salt. They shouldn't be full of chemicals. It、should be good, wholesome food.、Um, we give steamed carrots and steamed pumpkin and steamed sweet potato、um, and broccoli. We give them all of these things to induce breeding, to get the birds to feed. When a pair is rearing chicks, there's nothing that they like more than having a couple different fresh meals a day. It induces them to feed their chicks. I've been in aviaries where people complain. Geez, look at how emaciated my macaw chicks look. They're thin. And I ask them, how many times are you feeding? Oh, once a day in the morning. If you would just go by and add something special, the parents are induced to feed their chicks. To feed them again. So understand. Diet.、Um, I always tell people when I see a dirty cage, would you like to sleep in a dirty bed? Would you like to shower in a dirty shop? Would you like me to cook your food in a dirty in a dirty pot? Would you like me to serve your food in a dirty plate? And everybody says no. Would you like me to take the water not out of the tap but out of the toilet bowl? That's what you're doing when you don't wash dishes, when you use susceptible,、uh, skeptical water,、uh, water from skeptical sources. It's not clean. It's dirty. It's got things.、Uh, would you like to live 
in a room and not be let out and not have anything to do. No internet, no television. No, you wouldn't. So understand these things and provide the birds uh, things to do. I welcome you uh, to my home. We always have guests here. We don't have all the answers, and I say we because I am part of a team. Um, my workers help me. It's not my success; it's our success.、Um, I thank my family for putting up with me. Devoting so much time to the birds, I answer hundreds of questions every week. If you have a problem, I am very accessible. All that I ask is that when I give you an answer, you read it. There's nothing that irritates me more than me saying, "You need to put the bird on this oral product," and then the call is, "The next question is, can I put it in the water?" No, I didn't say water. I said oral. Or、uh, can you give me a good diet for my birds? And I give them a good diet, and the response is, "Well, that's too much work. I want to give them sunflower seed and apple." Why did you ask me? Clearly, you are not prepared to change. Don't waste my time, because you know what? There's other people that really need help, and I don't mind helping.、Um, I am accessible. I welcome people. I encourage you to participate in conventions. There are they are held throughout the world.、Um, this year, for example, there's been conventions in Spain. There will be conventions in Brazil, Belgium, Australia.、Um, U.S. Held all over the place. Participate. Don't be afraid to go up to somebody because you think they know more than you. There's never a stupid question, and there's nothing to fear but fear itself.、Um, I've had people approach me and say, "I'm surprised you would talk to me." I'm passionate about what I do. I would be deceiving myself. If I didn't try to help you, but when I try to help you, don't ask me a question like "What is the best diet for my bird?" and then tell me, "Well, that's too much work. I want to feed them sunflower seeds." You're hurting your birds. If you're new to this, understand that parrots are like a five-year-old kid that will require a lot of attention. That kid never goes to college, never leaves home. Never earns a paycheck, and it's there because it needs. You brought it to your home, and when it's there, it needs attention. It needs daily care. You don't whack the cage when it screams. You learn basic training. You don't cover the cage when it screams. There's lots of good information. When you look for information, verify the person's knowledge. I read lots of stuff on the internet. Even though I don't have a lot of hair, my hair stands up. I read things. For example, yesterday, someone was having a pox outbreak, and someone with clearly no knowledge said, "You take turmeric powder and you rub it into their eyes." There's no science for that. There's lots of science for dealing with pox.、Um, you don't, you don't contact, you don't consult with somebody that has no experience. Ask them. Would you go to your car repair man and ask him to remove your appendix or repair a hernia? No, you wouldn't. You go to a doctor. Ask people that have knowledge, that have experience. There's lots of us that help. Verify, question me. If you're asking me about something, hey, what knowledge do you have? What experience do you have? Genetics, I'm very poor at because I don't like mutations. So if you would call me and ask me, can you tell me the inheritance of this particular mutation? 
I would recommend somebody else. If you want to talk about hand rearing, species from purple-bellied parrots to palm cockatoos, I can help you there because I've reared them. I have lots of experience under my belt. So verify the person's sources. I, I thank you for coming to my home. I hope that I can affect a tiny amount of change, and that change is good diet, good hygiene. Listening to your birds and asking questions if there's doubt.、Um, this is the most fascinating hobby there is. It can give us tremendous joy, but it can be frustrating. It can lead to very expensive lessons, and it can lead to a lot of anger if we're not prepared for what we're doing. Understand. What you're getting into. Enjoy, ask questions, and know that there are no shortcuts. You don't buy a fertile、uh, a powder to add to your water that will make your birds breed. If they bred that easy, why are they worth so much money? I get people that say,、um, "Look, I want to add." Some magical essence to my birds, food so they breed. They're not chickens. Parrots are not chickens. If they bred as readily as that, would they be worth what they're worth? Ask yourself that question. Or I get another call. I get a, a very common message, sir. I've had a pair of African greys for three months. Why haven't they bred? I laugh, I get angry, and then my question, my response is usually the same: How much did you pay for them? And when they come back, I said, Do you think they would be worth that kind of money if they bred as readily as you think they would breed? How much are chickens worth in your part of the world? Pennies. Would the parrot be worth the amount of money that they're worth if they bred that readily? So understand these things. Participate in conventions. Get good sources of information. Reach out if there's a problem. But if you reach out, be prepared to affect change. And、uh, remember, we're like this as a community. It doesn't matter if you speak Arabic, or Farsi, or Spanish, or Portuguese, or English, or Hindu, Chinese, Tagalog. We all have one thing in common: a passion for agriculture. There are no boundaries. If we want good information, I communicate with many people. That English is not their language, and with Google Translator, we go back and forth. We can communicate, and if I can save one bird, I'm happy. If I can save ten, ecstatic. If I can make you help you become a better breeder, very happy. If I can make you become a better aviculturist. I consider I've won the lottery. So, from me to you, a lot of luck. Reach out for information, and、um, hopefully, hopefully, there will be a convention in the Middle East somewhere we can all meet, where we can take vets that are prepared to donate their time. They're not going to get paid for these conventions. I don't get paid for these conventions. They always cost me money. Because I must leave my office, and I must pay extra people to take care of the birds and the dogs.、Um, but I do it because it's passion.、And、these vets do it for passion. They want to share their knowledge. So, hopefully, we will meet at one of these events. We will be able to exchange ideas, and we will all enjoy the most fascinating hobby in the world. Thank you.
أنت قوي جدا لأنك واجهت أمورا قد تهدم الجبال ورغم ذلك جمعت ما تبقى من فتات روحك ثم وقفت وابتسمت وكأن شيئا لم يكن وكأن الحزن لم يطرق لك باب أنت تعلم أن الله لا يكلف نفسا إلا وسعها لذا عليك أن تعلم أيضا أنك قادر على مواجهة عالما بأكمله وحدك وبمفردك الله يعلم بقدرتك ويساعدك فقط عليك أن تنهض عند كل سقوط